Water. Earth. Fire. Air. I used to reminisce about the old days of the Avatar fandom. A time of peace. When Western TV animation was finally being shown as a potential medium for good storytelling. But that all changed when the Nickelodeon executives attacked. Only head writer Aaron Ehaz mastered the storytelling elements. Only by following in his footsteps could the ruthless Nick execs be stopped. But when Mike and Brian needed him most, he vanished. Three years have passed, and the Nick execs replaced the good Avatar name with the Legend of Korra. At the end of the first season, myself and the other disappointed Avatar fans abandoned Korra to preserve our good memories of the original show, leaving Tumblr to look after the fandom. Some people believe that Korra was as good as or better than Avatar, and that the series is darker and therefore more mature. But I haven't lost hope. I still believe that somehow, this review will return them to their senses and save the fandom. planning a party or something, just tell me now, okay, because, you know, I don't like surprises, and I swear I'll act surprised, okay? With a likable, well-developed cast of intelligent, kick-ass characters and a mature but kid-friendly plot, came one of the finest pieces of TV animation to grace Western media. It was a testament to the power of slightly higher quality animation than usual, coupled with good writing and storytelling. I'm talking, of course, about Avatar The Last Airbender, created by Ryan Konitsko and Michael DiMartino, or more simply, Brike. But then years later came the inevitable schlock to tarnish the good Avatar name. A true garbage mound of unintelligible refuse. It was terribly paced, the story made no sense, and it horribly butchered source material beloved by many diehard fans. No, not that. I... I mean Legend of Korra. I know it's popular to hate on the last Airbender movie, and rightfully so, but at least you can utterly disconnect that fucking god-awful adaptation from the original show. You can say that Bright had nothing to do with it, and leave it at that. But Legend of Korra is an honest-to-god, died-in-the-wool continuation of Avatar by Bright themselves. So no matter how horrendous, you can't really pretend it never happened. And unfortunately, Legend of Korra is an absolute travesty. It fails in every regard as a sequel, and to an even greater extent, it fails as a story. Oh, you can't compare it to another series that it directly associates itself with. That'd be completely unfair. Korra is its own story, even if it borrowed its universe setting, magic system, characters, plot threads, and pandering bait from Avatar. It's really its own thing. Really? Oh. My. 
god, you dense motherfucker! Alright, alright guys, I get it. I'm making a pretty bold claim here. A lot of retards on IMDb and TV.com really, really liked it, so my words are clearly tantamount to heresy. Sure, its animation, its visuals, and its sound design and soundtrack are top-notch stuff, but those are only there to facilitate the story. You can't tell a good story with just those things. You need a solid narrative with solid characters and solid execution. Legend of Korra simply does not have any of that. Oh! I must confess to a bias. I love Avatar The Last Airbender. I think it's great and a masterpiece of Western TV animation, and I'm objectively not wrong about that. But I can also recognize that it is, as with most things, flawed. Just for example... Just because no one has seen an airbender doesn't mean the Fire Nation killed them all. They probably escaped. I know it's hard to accept. You don't understand, Katara. The only way to get to an airbender temple is on a flying bison. And I doubt the Fire Nation has any flying bison. The timing was perfect to change the world. I knew the next Avatar would be born an air nomad. So I wiped out the air temples. What should we name her? I want our daughter's name to be unique. I want it to mean something. Destiny. 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 Stop it, Uncle. Destiny. 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 Destiny, 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 destiny. I know what I want to name our baby now. Destiny, hope. This goes against everything I learned from the monks. I can't just go around wiping out people I don't like. Starting to get some feeling back. Ow. taking his life, I love to hear it! So few things are perfect, but largely Avatar was cognizant of its limits and meticulous in working with or around them. We don't even know if Boomy's still... What? If he's still what? Around. 
The Ember Island Players episode is a hilarious and meta example of just how self-aware the show was. Legend of Korra, however, is a humongous disservice to true Avatar fans everywhere, stripping everything that was good and virtuous about the original show for a contrived and shallow continuation in the same vein as George Lucas' Star Wars prequels. Now, I know what some of you are inevitably thinking. Well, who are you to criticize Bright? It's their cartoon, they could do whatever the hell they wanted with it. Just because you were a fan of the original show, it doesn't entitle you to anything. Uh, no. Alright, allow me to flip the script on you. Who are you to criticize M. Night? It's his movie, he could do whatever the hell he wanted with it. Just because you were a fan of the original show, it doesn't entitle you to anything. They just don't get you. They've never got me, and it's getting worse. They're like, it's almost like, go away. Congratulations! Now The Last Airbender is a shining beacon of a film, above reproach, a prime example of what all movie adaptions ought to be. Good job, guys! I think most people, fans of Avatar and not, would agree with me that The Last Airbender movie is deserving of criticism, and that concession means that Legend of Korra is also deserving of criticism. But hey, just flinging facts around doesn't convince anybody, right? So why don't I just show you what I mean by all this? We'll start at the beginning and work from there. Book 1, titled Air, for all of the hot air Korra kept blowing out of her fucking ass. Let's do this. Legend of Korra begins with the Order of the White Lotus and the hunt for the next avatar in the Southern Water Tribe. Because Aang is super dead. Upon following up on an invitation from Tom Rock and Senna, the Order finds Korra. I'm the avatar! You gotta deal with it! No, Immediately, it's evident that there's a huge schism between Legend of Korra and the original show. Why didn't you tell us you were the Avatar? I'm because the Avatar. You got to deal never with it. To be. Keep these respective attitudes in mind for when I later decide which of them is indicative of a huge cunt. Korra here is approximately four years old. Already, she can bend water, earth, and fire. It's pretty safe to assume that she wasn't hard at work training as a toddler, right? So what the fuck? For comparison's sake, Aang was an airbending prodigy, having mastered the element at the ripe age of 12, the youngest airbending master in history. However, from the start, he's not shown to have mastery over any of the other elements, until he begins actively training with Katara. Even then, he only has a knack for waterbending, a reluctant affinity for firebending, and earthbending as a crapshoot. Airbending took him six years to master, and the other elements took him months of training to gain proficiency in, with the added pressure of having to take down Ozai before the arrival of Sozin's Comet. Mastering the elements takes years of discipline and practice, but if the world is to survive, you must do it by summer's end. Yet at only a fraction of his age, and with nowhere near the amount of effort involved, Korra is already miles ahead of him in bending. I guess Aang's not really much of a prodigy after all, because it's not like Korra is a shitty Mary Sue or anything. Now the toy relic test for determining the avatar, based off a real life Tibetan Buddhist method, is exclusively an air nomad thing for some reason. So I guess every other nation's avatar was born as an unbelievably precocious little shit. Now this is pod racing. Now, 13 years later, Korra has mastered all the elements except for air Bending. Oh, and Guitar is now Grand Grand. I don't know if she's aged well or not. And then you'll have your third great grandchild before quietly passing away in your sleep. Is that enough information for you? Why is my guitar so old? Now, it's worth noting that Korra is spiritually deficient. In fact, her connection to the spirit world is entirely non-existent. The show makes a point of this once at the beginning to try and explain why it's so difficult for Korra to pick up airbending later. But it's not really because of that at all. As you will be shown, every breakthrough that Korra has in airbending has fuck all to do with spirituality. And at no point in the show does Korra connect to the spirit world of her own accord. The show never really addresses Korra's lack of spirituality throughout the season, and so it remains just one of the many, many gaping plot holes. Aang and Katara's son, Tenzin, shows up with his family and- Wait a minute, is that a sky bison? Why are there more flying bison? You. You're supposed to be dead! Unless... You should really be wondering about an Appa and Momo romance. Appa and Momo romance. Appa and Momo romance. Oh no! 
I knew it was only a matter of time. Up and no homo, Momo. Well, according to the internet, Aang just so happened to stumble across an island with a whole subspecies of sky bison. And while there are no more flying lemurs, apparently, there's still a close relative called ring-tailed lemurs that, uh, also fly. Anyway, Tenzin and his adorable family swoop in, and it's pretty clear that they're either really concerned with repopulating the airbenders, or with Quiverful. It's so good to see all of you. Grand Grand, I've been reading all about your old adventures, and I've been dying to ask you, what happened to Zuko's mom? Well, Denora, it's an incredible tale. Oh my god! 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 But wait, they're only dropping in to tell Korra her airbending training will be put on indefinite hold because of reasons. And that they're heading back to Republic City in the morning. Now, was there no other way for Tenzin to communicate this than to take his entire family, including his very pregnant wife? Stop doting on me. I'm not helpless. I'm just pregnant. And to fly them more than halfway across the world to stay a single night at the South Pole? Was the use of carrier hawks discontinued in the past 70 years? In any case, it seems like Tenzin got a hold of a copy of the script and shuttled him and his family to the South Pole for a series of really ham-fisted character introductions, and possibly to set up a conflict for Korra to illustrate just how tough and independent she is, in spite of having a vagina. Fuck her right now! Tenzin tells Korra that the situation in Republic City is very unstable and that he's needed there, so Korra comes up with the brilliant plan of going back with him. If you can't stay here, then and I'll go back to Republic City with you. It's perfect. <sighs> Absolutely not. The city is far too dangerous. But Cora, that spunky little hothead that she is, decides to go anyway with her polar bear dog thing. There's a nice little scene paralleling Katara and Sokka's departure with Grand Grand, and Cora says goodbye to her parents, who apparently had no issue with her fleeing the White Lotus compound, against the White Lotus' wishes. That couldn't possibly be incredibly lazy writing. And so Cora is on her merry fairy way. It presumably takes a single night to reach Republic City. Gotta go back. But who boy, Republic City. It's the capital of a fifth nation called the United Republic of Nations. Aang put it together to, you guessed it, unite the four nations. Kinda like the plan of some other guy. Just by looking at it, you can tell a lot has changed in the past 70 years. High-rise architecture, airships, cars. Remember how Avatar was set in an ancient Asiatic-like world in which some people were able to manipulate the classical elements by use of psychokinetic variants of Chinese martial arts, known as bending, and that the world around them reflected that? Well, forget that, because, uh... Brian Knitzko really likes stuff having to do with the prohibition. Now we're in a kind of Asian-infused 1920s New York. <laughs> Historical parallelism is all very well and good, but why would all these technological advancements happen so quickly? Sure, the Fire Nation had its steampunk machinery, but that all came about during a century-long war for world domination. Why has industrialization gone forward so hardcore during peacetime? Seventy years ago, the cart and ostrich horse was the most advanced form of personal transportation. Bossing says trains were powered by earthbending. How in the fuck did cameras, telephones, and radios develop at the same time as the fucking printing press? You know, some of these took decades, even centuries before we saw them in forms like these in our own world. In our world, is without magical psychokinetic powers. Elsewise, you could bet technology would have evolved very, very differently. It's almost like Bright just thought all of this new stuff would look cool and didn't put any more thought into it than that. Like this giant monument of Aang. I mean, I doubt Aang, Mr. Dalai Lama ripoff, would have taken a strip out of Ozai's scroll and let a giant statue of himself be commissioned. But hey, it sure looks neato. It doesn't have to make sense. It just needs to look cool and innovative. It's basically at this point that Legend of Korra became inoperable as a story. There's no getting around that the setting has no rhyme nor reason to it and couldn't actually work, especially on the timeline we're given. It's incongruous with the Avatar universe in too many ways, yet everything in Legend of Korra takes place here. Everything takes place in this huge bumbling mistake. Legend of Korra is fundamentally broken. You can't cover that up. So from here on out, most of my complaints will just be nitpicking. Well, I'd like to think of it as pointing out really obvious in your fucking face flaws, but I can't underestimate the obliviousness of some people. Haha, <laughs> ignorant country bumpkin. Streets are for cars, not giant polar bear dogs. Ooh, those guys are fucking dead. After being chewed out by a vendor for not knowing that food costs money, Korra meets her first bag of Bond. And I guess it just dawns on her that the city doesn't just hand everybody everything they want. But she's the Avatar, so she knows that this doesn't apply to her. Next, she sees her first equalist demonstration. Are you tired of living under the tyranny of vendors? Then join the equalist! For too long, 
The bending elite of this city have forced non-benders to live as lower class citizens. Maybe they've got a point. Firebenders did cause a huge war with a devastating impact on the world. In fact, it seems like every major problem stemmed from benders. You know what? I kind of like that. A deconstruction of the Avatar setting was really the only way up as a sequel. Now, if only the new setting weren't so profoundly biased toward non-bending already. Did you see all the technology that doesn't require any bending at all? The only truly oppressive facet of benders now is that non-benders can't be them. Of course, Korra's oblivious to everything. What are you talking about? Bending is the coolest thing in the world! Yeah! Oh yeah? Let me guess. You're a bender. Yeah, I am. Yeah! And I bet you just love to knock me off this platform with some water bending, huh? I'm seriously thinking- Benders like this girl only use their power to oppress us! Yeah. What? I'm not oppressing anyone! You're... You're oppressing yourself! That didn't even make sense! And as if they couldn't hammer the point that Bender's all oppressive any harder, enter the Triple Threat Triad. You're in Triple Threat Triad territory, and we're about to put you in the hospital. You're the only ones who are gonna need a hospital. And for your sake, I hope there's one nearby. <sighs> They threaten one little shopkeeper and Korra decides to mop the street with him. Or, well, wreck the street with him. The police show up and arrest Korra because property damage is the only thing she's not allowed to get away with today. Fatality. Korra resists because, duh, she's the avatar. And there's a nice little chase sequence. Once you know it, Korra's caught. She briefly meets with Lin Bei Fong, Toph's daughter, and the token hard-ass lady police chief, then is bailed out by Tenzin, and endures no other consequences for her actions. What the fuck? She's immediately taken on as Tenzin's pupil, recognized by Republic City as the great and almighty Avatar, and all's well that ends well. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you, Republic City. All right, that's all the questions the Come on. How do you want to handle this? So, the Avatar has arrived early. It looks like we'll have to accelerate our plans. Man, Amon, good thing this series of events transpired in favor of your plans. I mean, if Korra were any less of a strong, independent woman, if her airbending teacher were any less lenient with her, and if her parents gave a single iota of a shit, who knows how long it would have taken for her to get to Republic City. If Korra weren't such a massive Mary Sue and had to travel the world to master the elements, like every other avatar, then you'd have to wait around forever to get your hands on her. Luckily, coincidence was on your side. Okay, get ready. I'm about to say something positive about Korra. This guy? is cool. Cool hood, cool mask, cool voice. The avatar has arrived early. Cool ominous music, just damn cool. Now, don't worry, the show's going to completely undermine his character in every possible fashion. But more on that later. 